Over the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about uh, this thing called the dandelion effect. And um, the first thing that we spoke of during that first week was this. We said our mission, we, we talked about our mission, and more specifically, we said because of Jesus' mission, which comes to us from Luke chapter 19, verse 10, I believe, where we read the words of Luke, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And because of Jesus' mission, we will live on mission here at Ferndale by engaging our communities, and by sharing God's transforming love. The next week, we took time and broke it down even a little bit more specifically. We said, well, what's that, what's that, really, what's that really mean? What's, what do we see? Well, we said because of Jesus' vision, because of what Jesus saw, which, again, I find grounded in Scripture. From Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we read these words where Jesus says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria until the ends of the earth. More specifically for us, we want to live that vision here at Ferndale because just as dandelion seeds are carried by the wind up to half a mile away from where they've grown, whereupon they grow new dandelions and they start the process over again. We want to be a church of the dandelion effect. We will reach diverse generations with the life-changing news of Jesus. We're called to reach those who live in Ferndale, Hazel Park, Royal Oak, our region and the world will flourish and experience the transforming power of life in Jesus. There is a very popular game by Milton Bradley called The Game of Life. Anybody ever heard The Game of Life? Game of Life. And it's been through tons of variations, all of which reflect kind of the changing values of our culture. Did you know that in 17... 98, before Milton Bradley, who was actually, I didn't know this, Milton Bradley was an actual person. Before he was ever born, there was a board game that came to us from England. It arrived in the United States, became very popular, and it was called The New Game of Human Life. And acquiring virtues, and it kind of sped you through the game, while vices slowed you down. Parents were encouraged to play the game with their children. The game's main point was this. Life is a voyage. Begins at birth, ends at death. God is at the helm. Fate is cruel, and your reward lies beyond the grave. In 1860, Milton Bradley invented a simple board game, and he called it the checkered game of life. The good path included honesty and bravery. The difficult path included idleness, disgrace. Industry and perseverance, they they led to wealth and success. Bradley described it as a highly moral game that encourages children to lead exemplary lives and entertains both old and young with a spirit of friendly competition. How many of you in here like to play board games? Raise your hand, like to play board How many of you insist on cheating in the board games that you play? Cheaters? No, of course you're not going to raise your hand because that's what cheaters do. Anyway, in 1960, the Milton Bradley Company, so by 100 years later, they released a commemorative edition called simply The Game of Life. And it sold 35 million copies. In this game, you earned money, you'd buy furniture, you'd have children, vices and virtues, they weren't existent. The winner of the game is the one who at life's day of reckoning makes the most money and retires at Millionaire's Acres. Does that sound familiar? That sound familiar? Yeah, right? Well, then in the 1990s, Milton Bradley game designers tried to make the game less about money. They emphasized good deeds, like saving an endangered species or solving a pollution problem. However, the only reward for those good deeds was cash. You can earn as much by winning at a reality TV show in the board. In 2011... Players can attend school, travel, start a family, or whatever they want. If they earn enough points, they can reward themselves with a sports car. 
There's no end or last square to the game. You can stop at any time. The box says, a thousand ways to live your life, you choose. Values are up for grabs. You can get as many points scuba diving or as you can donating a kidney. The description on the website about the game of life says this. Do whatever it takes to retire in style with the most wealth by the end of the game. Game of life. The values. The game of life. Friends, this week I want to turn our attention, our collective attention, to those things that we believe must be our values. Or another way to think about it is this. What are those things that are basic, fundamental beliefs that motivate what we do? What are those things we believe matter the most? It's critical. It's critical to add this as I talk about this. We have to think about these things through the lens of what Jesus valued. And there are, I believe, I believe there are at least five things, five values that I think Jesus considered non-negotiable. These might sound familiar to you. If not, that's okay. This is a good time to, to kind of learn these things. Here they are. I think Jesus valued the Word of God. I think Jesus valued intimacy with God. So the Word of God means the Bible. Intimacy with God means prayer. Okay? I think, God, I think Jesus valued connecting with others. Jesus built a new family. I think Jesus valued the love of God, which was expressed by preaching good news. I think Jesus valued the grace of God, and he demonstrated that by his embracing of other people. But how do we think those things will show up in our context here? What will those values actually, what will they actually look like here? I want to share with you what we believe the Lord's kind of led us to on this. Because of the things that Jesus values. We will seek to follow his example here at Ferndale, where our guiding values are. The Bible guides us. Prayer positions us. Relationships strengthen us. Jesus sends us, and grace motivates us. Now, one thing I realize is this is a lot to try and cover this morning. And that's the great part, though. That's the great part. It's not possible to cover it all at once and one time. It's a journey, actually, my friends. And living into the so many of these things that I've had the opportunity to share over the past few weeks, it's going to require time and patience. So with that in mind, let's begin this part of our journey together thinking about things that way. Time and patience. Is that okay? It's going to take time. It's going to require patience. So here's the first thing that we want to talk about when we talk about these values. We believe the Bible guides us. And the way that we demonstrate that here is by scriptural teaching and preaching. And it's critical that we anchor this value that we talk about in the Bible itself in both the Old Testament, where we read these words from Joshua, keep this book of the law always on your lips, meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. But also the words of the Apostle Paul from Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, where Paul writes, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. But not only demonstrated by scriptural teaching, the Bible guides us, and it's demonstrated by rooting all of our ministries in Scripture. Again, the guidance for this has to come from God's Word. In 2 Timothy, 
chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good word. Folks, just state it very simply. We will center God's Word, the Bible, and what we do. Now, you may have noticed that as I'm talking here, I'm really just sharing Scriptures with you. Well, that's because that's what matters most. Okay, And I want you to understand that there was a tremendous amount of thought that went into just kind of digging through God's Word uh, over the course of weeks as people sat and talked and thought and prayed through this. So the reason why I gave you the handout is so that you don't have to just take my word for it either. (laughs) Take it home. Read it. Check out those scriptures. Continue to kind of wrap your heart and mind around what we're talking about here. So that's the first value. The Bible guides us. Here is the second value that I want to share with you. Prayer positions us. Prayer positions us. And we want to try and demonstrate that here by incorporating prayer into every gathering. I love what James wrote in James chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Is anyone among you in trouble? What's the answer? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and to anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Folks, James is telling us quite simply, Whenever you're together, seek to make your time center around prayer. Now, I'll admit and I acknowledge we have some work to do in this area, but we want this to be a marker of who we are, who we are becoming. Additionally, we believe this value is going to be demonstrated by facilitating different prayer initiatives or or opportunities. And I love what comes to us again, from the Apostle Paul as he speaks to the Christians, to the church in Ephesus when he says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and keep on praying for all the Lord's people. There's a song that I heard years ago. It's just called Keep on Praying. Just real simple. The lyrics uh, come, they go like this. Keep on praying in the spirit and you just kind of repeat that phrase and then you say at all times with all kinds of prayer ephesians six eighteen says keep on praying quite simply we just keep on praying family we just keep on praying the next value that we want to commit to and hold to is that relationships strengthen us. And we want to live that out here by demonstrating and celebrating God's goodness to one another. Galatians chapter 6, verses 2 and 10, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Therefore, as we, oper- as we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. I want to take a time out there because I think this is important. We want to do good to all people. But you know who we're supposed to do good to especially? One another. That's not because it's some secret little club with a secret handshake. That's not the idea. The idea is that we love one another and we model with one another what we eventually take out there to share in the model for other people. Also, we believe that uh, this is demonstrated by looking out for one another's needs. And there is a verse of Scripture that I want you to make sure that if you aren't familiar with it, that you get this, that you that you. Literally, I want you to choke on this particular scripture, okay? It comes from Acts chapter 4. 
right after this thing called the church comes into existence. This is what we read. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them. All that were there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. We believe that we have been called to be a new family. And perhaps those, there are those of us who've not experienced family in the way that God wants us to experience it. We, but we want to be a place a place where our relationships with one another, they transform us, they change us. A fourth value, we believe Jesus sends us. And this matters greatly to us. And it's demonstrated by tangibly, tangibly, literally, actually, truly sharing the love of Jesus and Jesus' love with others. Because that's what Jesus did. Because he says this in John's Gospel, chapter 13, a new command I give you, love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Friends, if there is anything that we are struggling with in a moment as a people, as a nation, as a church, I'm not in church with a big C. It's this idea of loving other people. I don't know about you, but I'm seeing people say that they love other people, but they're shouting at them, they're yelling at them, they're calling them names. I don't think that's love. I don't know what you call it. It's not love. What does Jesus' love look like? I will admit this. That may depend. It may depend on the circumstance, Right? But one thing that is undeniable about love is that it's always making adjustments to meet the needs of those around us. Whatever, whatever it takes, that's what we do. And it may look different, but we do it. We love like Jesus loved. Here's another way that we demonstrate that Jesus sends us by empowering others for mission, uh, where they live, where they work, where they play. I want to say something about that last one in particular, empowering others where they live, where they work, and where they play. As this just isn't for mom and dad, or nana and papa, auntie and uncle. It's for our kids too. We want our kids to know that they're sent on mission as well. And what we read is because we, we loved you so much, is what Paul's writing to the church at Thessalonica, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. We want to do life together, which I get in trouble for saying when I say doing life together, because that's like an old saying, but I love it. Doing life together. Here's the last value that we want to commit to. Grace motivates us. We want to become known as a people of grace here at Ferndale. And we want to demonstrate that by welcoming everyone, no matter where they are on life's journey. Now let me before I share the scripture with you, this is a dangerous commitment to make because at some point you have to live up to it. <laughs> at some point, you're going to bump into people. Well, we may experience folks whose lives are really complicated and they will demand a lot emotionally, maybe financially, definitely spiritually. But that's what Jesus did. 
Jesus met people right where they were. He did not say uh, to people, you know, well, you can't have anything to do with me until you get your life together. Come see me in about two weeks. He didn't do that. We're not supposed to do that either. So we want to demonstrate this idea that grace motivates us by living out this commitment to love people right where they are. The Word became flesh, made His dwelling among us. Another translation reads, Jesus put skin on. We've seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John, meaning John the Baptist, testified concerning Him, meaning Jesus. He cried out saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because He was before me out of His fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace, truth, mercy. We want to see those things come to life here at FFMC. We also believe that grace will motivate us when we are demonstrating. We we demonstrate that by embracing those who live on the margins. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, God saved you by His grace when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done. So no one of us, so none of us can boast about it. In other words, it wasn't about you being born with a silver spoon. No, God found you. His grace found you. You didn't find Him. Here's something I kind of consider to be especially true. We believe that the good news of Jesus isn't truly good news for anybody unless it's good news for everybody. The good news of Jesus isn't truly good news for anybody unless it's good news for everybody. The immigrant, the differently abled, the racially profiled, the economically disadvantaged, the people who typically are just forgotten. We don't see them. Jesus was frequently attacked, questioned, because he was so incredibly filled with this grace. On one occasion, He was publicly attacked because of his grace-filled and focused lifestyle. Do you remember this morning? Dana read this. She said, from Mark, those who are healthy don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I've not come to get those who think that they are right with God to follow. I've come to get sinners to follow me. Not that I read this magazine every day, but, you know, psychology today, you know, that's kind of a, you know, magazine. But they wrote an article, which I think is really interesting, a few years ago. And the title of the article was, 10 Signs That You Know What Matters. We'll be talking about this morning, talking about values, things that matter, that you know what matters. And in this piece, there is a psychology professor by the name of Stephen Hayes who writes on the importance of people having and sticking to their values. And Hayes argues that values give life direction. They help us persist through difficulties. They nudge us, invite us. They, they draw us forward. They provide constant, soft encouragement. And in this excerpt from this magazine, I can't help but notice how these signs overlap with biblical truth about values that matter. He said this, he said, your values matter because you feel a sense of of enough rather than a need to measure whether you have more or less than others. 
Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I've learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. He also wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 through 8, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and what can't we do? We can't take it out, right? But if we have food and clothing, he continues, we can be content with that. You know that your values matter, that you, you're able to stick to your values because you can readily name your heroes. This sounds like a, a simple one, but it's, it's really true. It's powerfully true. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says this. He says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you read in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, you'll come across a whole slew of, of names, people who are considered heroes of the faith, people like Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah. Also, these values that matter, that keep you focused in the right direction, you don't know the content, but you can identify the theme of the next chapter of your own life's narrative. Galatians 2, 10, all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I'd been eager to do all along. The next chapter of your life, well, Psalms 139, verse 16 we read these words written by David. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now, you don't know the details, but you know, the, uh, you know what's going to happen in that next chapter. Another, another value is it's what you would do if nobody were looking. I just want to say something about this real quick. There's a, a pastor and an author that I have admired for years. He's well-known. And I remember years and years and years ago buying a book of his. You know what the name of the book was? Who You Are When No One's Looking. I read that book. I keep that book out of all of my library books, which Ruthie was gracious enough when I first started in ministry, to, she put me on the Dewey Decimal System. She's weird. But that way I could keep track of my books. I don't put that book in with the rest of the books. I leave that book on top of a shelf of books so that I can see the title, Who You Are When Nobody's Looking. And that's, that's a value. And a really great reminder about how important that is comes from 1 Samuel. This might sound familiar to some of you. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. And then over in Philippians 2, Chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 12, Paul writes, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear, trembling. Another way that you know that you are living into, living uh, out these values is you can only a few minutes write about what matters. Philippians 3, 14, Paul says this. He says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ, Jesus. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, he writes again, he says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Here's the last way that you know that these things that, you call values really can be seen and really obvious. You have a strong desire to communicate your interests to others. 
The Apostle Peter wrote this in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts, re revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks. To ask you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness, respect. It's not about shoving what I believe down someone else's throat, no. But I do need to be ready. Ready to tell others about why, why this Jesus matters so much. Friends, as we envision ourselves as a church of this dandelion effect. These values, they're critically important as we kind of navigate the way forward into the future. And as I end this morning, I want to be clear about something that I've not touched on. But I do think it's kind of critical. This mission that we've talked about, the vision that I've shared, the values that are on the sheets of paper that I've shared with you this morning. Friends, they're not for everyone. There's a good chance, though, there's a really good chance that as our future becomes our present, we will all get to witness a movement of God. And we'll talk about it for years to come. Would you pray with me? And so, God, as we seek to be people who live out these values, we let your word, the Bible, guide us. We believe in that. Lord, we engage in the practice of prayer. Lord, we seek to grow closer to one another in relationships. Lord, we are people of good news. We know that Jesus has sent us. God, we are people of grace and mercy. We open our arms and welcome, authentic welcome and love to everyone. God, we know that you will be honored by these things. And God, you will, you will give us You'll give us great, uh, great power to do it. We'll be strengthened by you. And Lord, we know that it's a long journey. It's not going to happen overnight. But God, we ask that you would give us everything that we need for this, this opportunity to be your people in this way. Help us not to be discouraged. Help us not to be distracted. And Lord, we pray that we would be honest, we would be real, we would be authentic. But Lord, that we would trust in your transforming power. We love you and we thank you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.